the nature of returns in the financial markets and measuring returns. A previous lecture put forward a model for the expected returns on a risky asset that takes the following form. That the expected return on a risky asset was equal to the risk-free rate plus a risk premium. This is the market required expected return given the risk of the asset. It's the opportunity cost of capital used to discount an asset's cash flow stream. The risk premium reflects the risk and return relationship established in the financial markets. If we can price risk, we can price risky financial assets. The key to pricing risky assets is determining the market price of risk. We then use the market price of risk to determine the risk premium in the model. We need to answer the following questions. What is the relevant risk in a risky investment? How do we measure this risk? And how does the market price this risk? To answer these questions, we'll be examining the risk and return relationship in the financial markets and further developing our model for the expected return on a risky asset. We begin by exploring the nature of returns in the financial markets. This involves a statistical analysis of returns over a long period of history. So we'll be looking at historical financial returns on various securities traded in the financial markets in the United States over an 83-year period, beginning in 1926 and ending in 2008. Three central facts emerge from the statistical analysis concerning the nature of returns in the financial markets. Riskier assets have higher returns, on average, than safer assets. The return of risky assets are correlated with one another. And returns on financial market securities show no discernible pattern over time. We'll look at the statistical measures that produce these results. We begin with the basic measurement of an asset's return. Return is a measure of the effect of an investment on the investor's financial position. The most basic measure of return is the investment's total dollar return. Total dollar return measures the absolute change in wealth from the investment over a period of time. In this lecture, we'll be primarily concerned with returns over an annual period. Total dollar return consists of an income component. These are cash payments made by the security. They can be dividends from stock. They can be interest from bonds. The total dollar return also includes a capital gain. This is the appreciation of the price of security over the period. So an investment's total dollar return consists of the cash payment made in the period and the change in the asset's price over the period. The end of period price minus the beginning of period price. It's more convenient to summarize the information about returns in percentages rather than dollars because percentages can apply to any amount invested. The percentage return on an investment answers the question, how much return do we get for each dollar invested? As a relative measure, it allows us to compare the effect on financial position of alternative investments. We calculate the percent return for the period by dividing the total dollar return by the initial dollar investment. A holding period is a length of time over which an investment is held by its owners. The holding period return is the percent return earned over the entire holding period. The holding period can consist of many years. The holding period return is most likely 
a multi-year return. The holding period return can be easily calculated given the cost of the investment at the beginning of the holding period and the value of the investment at the end of the holding period. And let's look at an example. Suppose we invest $100 today and have $129.50 at the end of a three-year holding period. What is a three-year holding period return? From the ending period value, we subtract the cost of the investment at the beginning of the period to get the change in financial position over the holding period. This is divided by the initial cost to get the holding period return, 29.5%. We can also calculate the holding period return given the returns for each year in the holding period. We would compound the annual returns over the holding period by adding one to each of the annual returns and multiplying them together and then subtract one. Let's look at an example. Given a three-year holding period where the investment earns 8% in the first year, 10% in the second year, and 9% in the third year, what is a three-year holding period return? We compound the 8%, 10%, and 9% returns over the holding period and subtract 1 to get the holding period return 29.5%. Now suppose we wanted a measure that describes the annual returns in the holding period a measure used to describe the annual returns in a holding period is the average return, also called a mean return. We'll use the terms average and mean interchangeably in the lectures. There are two types of average returns that are used to describe the returns in a holding period. The first average we'll examine is a geometric average return, also called the geometric mean return. The geometric average return is the constant annual return that compounded over the holding period will give the holding period return. It's an average that takes into account compounding and so it's also called the compound annual return. Let's look at an example. Over the three-year holding period, the investment in our previous example earned a total holding period return of 29.5%. What was the geometric average return of the investment? The geometric average return is that constant return that if compounded over the holding period gives a holding period return. We'll let capital T equal the length of the holding period. We solved the equation for G. So the geometric average return is 1 plus the holding period return raised to the 1 over t power minus 1. So for the example problem, we add 1 to the 29.5%, making it a decimal. Take the cube root and subtract 1 to get the geometric average return of 9% is the compound average return that when compounded over the holding period gives the holding period return. Let's look at another statement of the problem. We invest $100 today and have $129.50 at the end of a three-year investment period. What is a three-year geometric average return? In this example, we're given a beginning value and an end of period value. We can express this as the present value times a future value factor at the geometric average return for the length of the holding period, and that equals the future value. Now we solve for G by dividing $129.50 
by $100. Taking the cubed root, subtracting 1 to get the geometric average return 9%. We recognize this formulation as the formula for the geometric average return in the previous slide, where 129.5 divided by 100 is 1 plus the holding period return. We also recognize this as a time value money equation, which can be solved in an Excel spreadsheet for the rate of return. The spreadsheet inputs. PV, present value, is a negative 100 because it's the cash outflow to make the investment. FV, future value, is 129.5, cash inflow. And PER, number of periods, is a three-year holding period and the spreadsheet solves for rate. In the holding period return example problem, given a present value of $100, we created a future value of $129.50 by earning 8%, 10%, and 9% over the three-year holding period. We could also create that future value by earning the 9% geometric average in each year. The geometric average return describes how we might get from point A to point B in time by earning a constant return in each period. So the geometric average return is a way of describing the investment. Earning 8% followed by 10% followed by 9% is like earning 9% per year for three years. And this is the interpretation given to the geometric average return. The other return is the arithmetic average return, also called the arithmetic mean return. The arithmetic average return is the arithmetic average of the annual returns over the holding period. This is the average that we are most familiar with. To calculate the arithmetic average return, we add up the annual returns in the holding period and divide by the number of observations, t. It answers a question. What is the best unbiased estimate of the annual return we could expect to earn in any given year in the holding period? Given a three-year investment period where the investment earns 8% in the first year, 10% in the second year, and 9% in the third year, what is the arithmetic average return? We add 8%, 10%, and 9%, and divide by 3, the number of observations, and get the arithmetic average return, 9%. Let's compare the interpretations given to the averages to understand the circumstances in which one of the averages is a more meaningful average. The geometric average return is what was actually earned per year on average, compounded annually. The geometric average return describes the actual investment experience. It tells us how we created the future value over the holding period by earning the average compound return in each period. The arithmetic average return is what can be expected to be earned in any given year. So the arithmetic average return is an expectation. It makes predictions. It tells us what return to expect in a typical year in the holding period. So, the distinction between the two. The geometric average return is descriptive. The arithmetic average return is predictive. The geometric average return is used to describe how the investment created its future value over the holding period. The arithmetic average return predicts the expected return in any given year in the holding period.